More precisely, her upcoming work will highlight how the COVID-19 pandemic has increased and altered existing barriers for women and gender diverse people who are accessing services and supports related to intimate partner violence and gender-based violence more broadly in the rural northern region of Restigouche, New Brunswick. Mamie's presentation will, <clears throat> excuse me, will overview her doctoral research, which explored trauma-informed relational embodied approaches to addressing violence, including wartime violence, structural systemic violence, family violence, and gender-based violence. Her dissertation examined yoga-based rehabilitative programming in post-conflict Colombia in collaboration with the nonprofit peace-building organization, DUNA. DUNA works to address deeply rooted cyclical and intergenerational violence embedded in Colombian society through building capacity for coexistence and trust within communities. The co-founder of DUNA, Natalia, and I already apologize to Natalia if I uh, don't do justice to her family name. Kignonas uh, will be joining Mamie as, uh, as she goes through her presentation. I look forward to this. Uh, I think it will be extremely informative. Uh, and in the past, I have learned much from Mamie and I expect the same thing today. So over to you. Thank you so much, Norma. Um, it definitely feels like a full circle moment for me to have you um, introducing me for this presentation. Um, as Norma mentioned, I, I met her when I was a fiery little intern uh, many, many years ago, and I learned a lot from her about the complexities of feminist work and also feminist work in a transnational um, cross-cultural context. So um, it means a lot to have you here for this presentation. And I also wanted to thank all of the organizers who have made today possible. There's a lot of behind the scene work that goes into these webinars and um, I'm really grateful to be here and to be a part of this um, and to be um, starting this new position at the Miriam McQueen Center. Um, I also wanted to thank each of you for taking the time to be here today, um, especially during the circumstances of the ongoing pandemic. Um, our energy is, um, very precious, so I appreciate you taking your lunch hour to spend it with us. Um, so I'm joining today from my home office, which is situated on the unceded and unsurrendered lands of the Week. And um, while my background is in peace studies and looks at violence within this particular context, the lessons that I've learned from Duna and from the Colombian case in general, I think are really relevant to Canadian and New Brunswick contexts and within uh, many of the sectors that the MF, MMFC works. Um, so the um, intersections between uh, the work of the MMFC and um, this peace studies project have really been on my mind the last several months as I've been transitioning from my PhD work to a more localized and community rooted project um, here in New Brunswick. Um, so having spent all of this time thinking about the Colombian case, I've been asking myself, you know, what can we learn from Duna and from Colombia about building peace in non-war settings like in Canada? And what can we learn from Colombia about recovering from complex and intergenerational forms of violence and trauma that manifest on individual, interpersonal, um, community and state levels? Uh, what can we learn from Duna about arts-based, creative and embodied methods of peace building, um, such as yoga? Um, when we're considering ongoing issues in Canada around systemic violence and colonialism, um, issues with our um, carceral and justice systems, or in general about outreach and care for families um, struggling with domestic violence. So it's a big honor today to have Natalia Quinones um, here with us. Um, so how we're going to structure the presentation is I'm going to give a little bit of a background on um, the theoretical groundings of my particular project, which is a very small piece of Duna's work and sort of one research project of many research projects that they do. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about, 
about the theory um, and sort of this question of why yoga um, and introduce you to what some of my research questions for my project were. And that will lead into Natalia's section where she'll go over um, more information about the organization, the work that they do, and also speak about the broader context of their projects um, and the post-conflict reality in Colombia. And then we'll sort of jump back into um, my particular PhD project and share some of the key research findings from that. Um, and at the end, we'll sort of loop back to some of these um, questions that I've just introduced about what does all of this mean um, to us here in New Brunswick and how can we learn from the expertise of Duna about this topic. So my PhD research is situated within a broader discourse in the field of peace studies that is seeking um, dynamic solutions to um, issues of war and conflict. Um, my work specifically looked at the limitations within peace studies and the lack of um, a psychosocial and relational understanding of peace within that framework. I think we spend a lot of time um, looking at the big picture stuff following a conflict and the need to sort of rebuild infrastructure and really critical things, but looking at these uh, more individual and interpersonal dynamics of peace are also really important. Um, and I had the opportunity to explore um, this field with Duna in Colombia. I was working with them for um, three months um, as a research fellow and um, got to sort of follow along and learn about their work and also integrate some of um, the interviews that I did for my own project within their framework. So. Um, basically, I've looked at um, alternative and community rooted methods for building peace and the method that I've largely studied is yoga and with the organization Duna. So by studying this particular method in this particular context, my research really was an exploration of what peace work is, what it is not, and what it could be by learning from grassroots actors that are actively reimagining what peace can look like for themselves, um, their families, communities, and whole nations. And for context, the um, theoretical grounding of my work is in the field of transrational peace philosophy, um, which is sort of a fancy way of saying um, that we need to look at the intricacies of human nature and our relations and see individual, interpersonal, communal, and national peace, not as separate, but as integrated and interdependent. Um, yeah, so. The method that I looked at for my project um, was yoga and Yoga in a global north context um, often has a pretty bad reputation and is associated with um, sort of excessive celebrity culture and fitness goals, um, whiteness and thinness. Um, and those iterations of yoga are often critiqued for um, being disingenuous and culturally appropriative, um, both in how the yoga is consumed and commodified. Um, so the global dialogue around what yoga is and what yoga means is really complicated and um, it's you know not possible to convey all of that in this short presentation. Um, but I wanted to show sort of a, a flip side of yoga and um, talk about how yoga is also being used as a rehabilitative and reconciliatory outlet. Um, so right now, yoga is being engaged around the world um, to address complex, complex issues such as displacement, deep-rooted conflicts, long-standing violence, and there are examples around the world in countries such as Rwanda, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, South, Sud South Sudan, and Afghanistan. So in many corners of the globe, yoga is being used to cope with patterns of conflict-related violence and their individual manifestations such as PTSD, anxiety, and depression. So I went into this project with several questions 
Um, I wanted to know more about what yoga meant in these types of spaces and you know how did it complement or even contradict um, existing peace building efforts. Um, I wanted to know how something like yoga was different from other alternative and creative methods that are commonly used in peace building. Things like art therapy, dance, um, creative writing and theater are all really common across the globe. And I wanted to dive into this sort of transrational peace studies angle of how was yoga working on all of these different levels? So what did yoga mean on individual levels? How was it helping with interpersonal and relational conflicts um, in the context of families or with um, aspects of society like domestic violence? And I wanted to know, you know, could these things, could these um, interactions with yoga have a meaningful impact on broader community levels and on peace processes? And I also wanted to know how would this or how could this tie into broader peace studies discourses and how um, does Duna's work um, challenge and change and um, propel this discipline forward? Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Natalia now and um, she's going to introduce us to a little bit more about the organization and the context that the organization works within. Thank you so much, Mamie, and thank you also to the MMFC for hosting us today. We're, we're very happy to be able to share our work with um, people who are doing similar work in different latitudes. Um, so thank you again. Um, DUNA is a nonprofit organization, um, which I co-founded in 2010 with Maria Elaida Lopez, um, who is our, our executive director and sends her best regards. She can't make it today. Um, our idea when we created DUNA was um, to have something different um, to contribute to the peace building efforts um, that, that were already starting in 2010. Um, many of you don't know much about the Colombian context, but we've been having a very large um, scale conflict that has lasted over, well, lasted over 50 years. Um, in 2010, we, we had some peace building efforts um, with um, some of the paramilitary illegal armed groups giving up their weapons. Um, and, and what we were seeing back then is exactly the same um, absence that, that Mamie has um, mentioned earlier on um, the lack of a psychosocial and mental health approach to peace building in general. Um, we also saw that um, there were very few um, monetary resources um, destined to this type of work. Um, so we wanted to create alternatives that were um, cost effective and cost efficient to bringing healing and well being and um, emotional recovery and peaceful coexistence to our communities. Um, a, a main of our work um, is based on yoga and mind-body practices in general, including mindfulness, breathing. Um, and we, we, we chose these tools um, also because we wanted to decolonialize um, the effects of yoga um, in our society. You know, we, we did have um, yoga brought as, a, as an elite practice um, for um, women with a lot of resources in the big cities in the country. Um, but we saw the benefits that those practices had um, in the trauma, in the healing of trauma that, um, that resides in our bodies. So we, we decided that this had to be shared with um, anyone who wanted to be a part of it. Um, but, but we also wanted to um, take stake from what our peoples had originally um, designed as ways to cope with trauma. So what we did is blend in um, the wisdom of yoga with local traditional practices 
um, such as active listening, um, the word totem and other social technologies in order to create um, workshops and programs um, that, would, that would install um, capacity in, in the communities to regulate their nervous system and to start healing trauma um, on their own. You know, that's a, another beauty of, <coughs> I apologize, another beauty of mind-body practices is that it allows people to, to be in charge of their own healing. You know, you don't need a psychologist or a psychiatrist or, or a third party in charge of your healing. You can do it yourself and, and at your own pace. Um, so what we offer in the field are several workshops. They are tailored to the uh, issues that each community is facing. Um, and, and what we create is um, peace in their bodies so that um, this inner peace can um, be the foundation of a collective peace building effort. Maybe if we move um, to the next slide, maybe. Um, just a little bit more about the armed conflict. Um, we had all sorts of armed um, actors fighting each other um, since the 1960s, a very high death toll, um, a very high rate of uh, civilian displacement. Um, and we also had um, a general breaking of the social fabric. You know, the, the trust of, of your neighbor, of your community was completely eliminated due to the tactics used by these armed groups. Um, also, uh, a complete lack of the presence of the state um, caused the murder of social leaders, um, an increase in urban crime and power vacuums that are still existing. And, and what we want to do is transform <clears throat> all these roots of violence um, because we believe that the trauma that comes from this whole uh, very painful conflict um, keeps repeating itself in family dynamics, in school dynamics, you know, having signed a peace agreement is just not enough. We need to keep working in the way we resolve day-to-day um, -day conflicts. And what we see is that we're still very violent, you know, the trauma that we carry um, from generations past um, is still showing in the way that we solve our conflicts in school, um, within our families, um, and in our communities in a broader context. So what we want to do is break these violent cycles and, and retrain <laughs> um, our, our participants and the general Colombian population um, in a, in a non-violent way of resolving day-to-day conflicts and of coping with day-to-day -day difficulties. So this is mostly what we do. Back to you, Maine. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, so now I wanted to speak a little bit about um, my research. Um, and I wanted to highlight um, the interviews that I did in a community setting. Um, specifically with DUNAS participants um, who are part of coexistence programs. Um, so these participants live in government funded social housing units across Colombia that were created as part of government reparation efforts. So residents qualify for living in these communities because they're low income, live at the intersections of poverty and violence, are displaced and or were significantly affected by the armed conflict. Um, so I thought that highlighting these particular interviews would be uh, most relevant to the MMFC and um, really speak to the um, intersections that Natalia just highlighted between um, broader um, state structures and armed violence and how this manifests and shows up on individual and um, interpersonal levels. So many of the participants that I spoke to talked a lot about the everydayness of violence um, that they were exposed to, including domestic, domestic violence, general harassment and sexual aggression, um, fights between neighbors, um, often hearing arguments through their walls, and also um, violence between um, 
residents and security guards of the compound. And we have grouped the sort of findings and themes um, based on the interviews in um, different categories. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about um, the role of yoga in peace building um, at, coming from the interviews. So in general, um, participants talked about the um, limits and delays of reparations for victims, um, the limits of conventional treatment for trauma, and um, how yoga was filling a gap in those spaces. So in terms of um, collective peace building, um, yoga was an opportunity for Duna's participants to connect with one another and socialize, but the effects of doing yoga together in a shared space um, was much broader than that. Some participants found yoga to be useful in building compassion for their neighbors um, or building coexistence despite maybe having very um, polarizing or differing views um, between them and their neighbors. So many participants reported um, less anger and conflict, better interactions with their neighbors and family, as well as uh, an increased sense of trust within their communities. Um, participants reported that the classes benefited their relationships within their families, helped them better cope with um, conflicts within their own families, and control that um, sort of sense of reactivity and um, a lot of the participants I spoke to were also parents and found that um, the tools of yoga were really helpful in their parenting and also a really nice activity to do as a whole family. Um, and I think most centrally, participants talked about violence um, being reduced overall in the social housing complexes that they lived uh, since the yoga programs began. And on an individual level, a key theme um, was hypervigilance. Um, so this translates to experiences such as being easily reactive to stimulus, feeling on edge, uh, tension in the body, feelings of disassociation and anxiety. And uh, living chronically in this bodily state has um, compounding physiological and psychological consequences. And a lot of the participants spoke to me about those sort of longstanding chronic health ailments um, and other manifestations of trauma. So participants reported um, a really wide range of symptoms such as anxiety, depression, insomnia, and PTSD. Um, and in those particular cases, participants reported the use of um, focused breathing and the sort of present moment and bodily awareness aspect of yoga and these sort of opportunities for introspection um, and sort of coming back into the body um, were really helpful. Um, other emotional and psychological benefits reported included um, the increased ability to focus, the ability to regulate emotions, and in general, um, a space to cultivate feelings of safety within their body and within the space and sort of be able to contemplate and process some of the past experiences and um, past trauma that they've, they've been through. And on a physical level, um, participants reported less ailments such as physical pain, headaches, and better sleep. So before we close today, I wanted to just sum up some of the key takeaways of the research. So um, my particular research project sort of under the broader DUNA umbrella um, found the need to look closely at these creative embodied and low resource community driven methods of building peace within a broader um, peace studies framework. An important um, finding that came out was the need to address these secondary mental health impacts, especially across populations who may not have formally been engaged in the conflict. So a lot of the people that I spoke with um, felt the effects of violence in their communities, but maybe weren't combatants or on the front line of the conflict themselves. 
So my research largely explored the everydayness of violence and the profound impact of the war, not just on these frontline combatants, but on citizens at large. In the Colombian case, those considered to be perpetrators or victims of violence received limited mental health care in the form of five talk therapy sessions following the demobilization of the FARC. And anyone not falling into these categories were left without access to care. Um, so another lesson from the Colombian case is that the group-based nature of Duna's yoga programs um, can be a really critical and often overlooked part of long-term mental health care, um, especially given the highly relational and communal um, aspects of Colombian culture. Um, this was sort of a recurring theme that felt really important. It wasn't just doing yoga um, on your own, but it was the ability to connect and be part of community as well. And interviewees also noted that the conventional approaches to mental health, such as talk therapy alone, might be less appropriate in context of long-term violence um, that is deeply rooted into family and social structures. So considering what we've learned about relational, secondary, and intergenerational trauma, dynamic and creative mental health intervention therapy should be considered um, in peace building practices and research. So another key finding um, is this relationship between mind and body. Interviewees of the project pointed to this connection over and over when sharing about their lived experiences with yoga. And in reviewing my findings, I was really surprised by the number of participants that spoke to me about physical pain and health ailments um, and how yoga benefited this. Um, Participants were able to, through yoga, return to um, life activities and work that they um, didn't think was possible um, or achievable. So I think that um, this result was um, really fascinating and urged me to dive deeper into secondary research, which spoke to this relationship between mind and body in post-conflict settings. So, what I found was data emerging from around the world on yoga and meditation's ability to have effects on the body, such as in rewiring the nervous system and increasing gray matter in the brain, um, both of which are highly correlated with brain functions, such as attention and emotional regulation. So researchers are finding a strong correlation between early adverse and traumatic life experiences and the development of serious chronic health ailments and pain later on in life. And similar um, connections are being made between pain and exposure to war, um, with the pain prevalence um, in refugee populations being as high as 83%, which I think is a finding that is um, really critical in a Canadian context as well. Um, so these findings suggest that there may be a dynamic and reciprocal relationship between these biological, psychological, and social factors that interact and contribute to the experience of pain. And um, this can't be overlooked when we're studying violence in any context. Um, and so these findings sort of feed into this um, broader conversation about peace building and um, ways of doing peace building differently and how we can integrate some of this relational and embodied work into peace work, especially when state-led and state-funded initiatives are lacking or are limited in their capacities to respond to the inter intricacies of trauma. So, the growing criticisms of conventional peace theory and peace work are calling for new ways of understanding and working towards peace building. And I think that one of these paths can be and should be this deeper understanding of the psychosocial nature of conflict and call for a relational understanding of peace work. Um, so aspects of peace building, such as being able to relate to community members and rebuild trust and coexist despite differences might appear minor but it can significantly influence the um, outcome of a peace process. And this brings me back to some of the preliminary questions that I posed about um, what can we learn from Columbia? Um, my hope is that this research can extend the conversation further 
and um, move beyond simply acknowledging that the nature of violence and conflict um, is inherently messy and complex and instead seek new and dynamic ways of addressing this in our communities. Um, the longstanding and multidimensional nature of the Colombian conflict has led its country's peacemakers to finding new and robust solutions. And I think there's really so much to be learned from um, Duna's work in this regard. And I think that there can be um, a lot of lessons learned for um, a Canadian context. We often don't talk about peace building in Canada. Um, it's sort of reserved for the um, international and that Canada is inherently peaceful and we are sort of the peacemakers and um, peacekeepers around the world. But um, all it takes is a quick flip through the news to know that um, there are ongoing conflicts within a Canadian context and um, major complexities and intergenerational forms of trauma um, related to colonialism and racism and incarceration and other structures. So um, I think applying a peace building framework to the work that we do um, in terms of community violence prevention work um, can be really interesting. And um, yeah, overall, um, I'm really grateful for all of you um, taking the time to be here and for Duna um, sharing all of these rich insights with us. And we will move um, to some questions. Thank you, Mamie and Natalia. That was really interesting. Um, a few words that kind of stick stuck with me is the, I wrote it down here, the everydayness of violence um, and how, you know, the violence is cyclical and you really, um, and that really translates, I think in, in work for just intermittent partner violence really translates. Um, I also found uh, the trends so the transnational uh, or, or transrational uh, peace building approach and how when you were talking about it, it reminds me a, a lot of how about how service providers really rely on one another um, to support survivors of intimate partner violence and how this can be implemented that way. So thank you very much. Um, so we have a few questions uh, to start with. Um, so emotional regulation in, of individuals has been critiqued. Um, because it can dampen social activism efforts. Um, have you observed this and have there been impacts in terms of civil society engagement? Maybe, um, do, do you want to say something first, maybe, or, or um, should I go first? Yeah, you go ahead. That'd be great. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much, um, Catherine, for this very interesting question. Um, in the Colombian context, we've experienced quite the opposite. Um, emotional regulation has been the key to bring people together um, in very important social movements and initiatives. Um, what we found um, as a consequence of the armed conflict was that there were no networks at all um, for social activism happening, especially in the rural areas where the conflict had been the most violent. Um, so bringing <clears throat> emotional regulation as one of the variables, obviously this is not you know, the only focus of our work. We, we also um, empower um, participants um, and, and bring other ingredients into this, this feeling of individual and community um, peaceful coexistence. But, but what we found specifically regarding emotional regulation and, and social activism is that in this context, um, we, we just couldn't get together um, in a peaceful way to discuss um, collective aims that would actually produce social mobilization. So um, we've had wonderful experiences with, for example, in the very south of the country um, in the Amazonian jungles. Um, we've had indigenous communities realizing that the um, politicians governing them were not really listening to their needs. So after um, engaging in a, in a Duna workshop, they got together and they installed 
well, they, 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 they created a, an indigenous social movement to oust the, the local um, governing board, say, for, it, for the territory. Um, and they installed the word totem um, as, as a social technology in, in, this, in the community. <clears throat> so anyone who had any, um, anything to say would be actively listened to. Um, <clears throat> that this, this was only possible because they, they were actually able to speak to each other and realize that they all shared a feeling of insatisfaction with the way they were being governed. Um, and, and because of the lack of trust that the, the yarn conflict had created um, and, the, and the difficulty in expressing emotions and expressing um, uh, a free identity, <laughs> um, this had just not been possible. So, so I guess um, it, it, it is a valid question and, and it's something that you have to observe in the specific context but in the Colombian context, it has been a key to bring people together just to listen to each other and realize what are the, goal, the goals that we need to fight for together. Um, so I, I just gave you one example so that we can have um, some other questions, but, but if you're interested, um, please feel free to write to us. We have many examples of how um, our participants have engaged in um, activism and, and achieved wonderful changes in their communities. Great, thank you, Natalia. Would you be okay with my sharing your email address in our chat so that everyone can take it down? Yeah, absolutely, I'll, I'll, I'll be typing it down. Oh, yeah. okay, perfect, thank you. Sure. So um, another question we have, so this is from Janet. Um, um, so she says, hi, I'm a social worker and yoga teacher in the community, and I'm curious about the idea to use multiple styles or aspects of yoga to meet the varied needs of people. I have used yoga as part of my work uh, with intimate partner violence. Um, do you see this as an effective model to consider in working with women in transition from a group perspective? Um, I mean, I really think so. I think uh, yoga has a lot of um, benefits on an individual level and in bringing people together. Um, I think that Duna is an example of um, really curating and, and fine tuning a yoga program to meet the specific needs of a population in a way that's trauma informed. And from what I saw um, working with them, there was constant feedback from participants. Um, so they were also a part of designing the programs. And um, I think that that's also really important and integrating the yoga with some of these other um, techniques like Natalia mentioned, like active listening. Um, and yeah, I don't know Natalia, if you wanna add anything else in, um, about sort of how how yoga could be used for women um, transitioning from violence in a Canadian context. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think yoga is very useful um, also to helping um, them reconnect with their bodies. I think um, what we've found um, with um, survivors of, of domestic violence in general is a, a a disassociation or, or a general, you know, um, difficulty in connecting to their own bodies and and their own needs. You know, sometimes you you really need to connect to your body to be able to understand what it is that you need. Um, so so yoga, I think, is, is a very useful tool that, that that is universal in that sense. You know, it can help anybody in any context reconnect with what their body. Is telling them, you know, if if your body's telling you that you are not comfortable in a situation, then you might be more empowered to to make choices of, you know, who you share your space with and um, when to leave, when to stay, mm. um, which are questions that I think all women face um, in the context of domestic violence. So, um, 
creating that connection, I think is, is a key contribution that, that yoga can make, um, Janet. Um, and then also, um, I think creating this, this um, compassion, you know, inner compassion where, where you witness your rage, your, um, your discomfort and, and any emotion that has been tagged as negative, you know, in our Western societies, you know, you're not supposed to feel depressed, you're supposed to do something about your depression, you're not supposed to feel angry, you're not supposed to feel all sorts of things that you actually do feel. Um, so being able to, to deal with those emotions, you know, um, listen to them and give them a space um, so that they don't become an actual illness. Because that what, what we've seen with all the physical ailments that Mamie was mentioning um, is that, you know, if we don't give um, that space in our bodies to, to those emotions that have been tagged as negative, um, we, we can actually develop all sorts of um, physical symptoms <laughs> and illnesses. Um, and, and those are just, you know, those emotions that they have been somehow repressed. So um, yoga, you know, um, meditation and deep relaxation can help women um, create that space um, to accept those emotions and observe them as a witness, not, not being involved in the suffering, but, you know, creating a compassion and, a, and the proper distance, you know, <laughs> Um, with what has happened so that so that they can um, allow those feelings to 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 happen and be observed without reacting to them immediately so so that that breaks the cycle of violence so that they they don't feel like they need revenge or something like that um, and it, it prevents any other physical consequences from uh, the trauma that they've experienced so I think that's also a uh, an important contribution of yoga and more specifically of meditation and observing your thoughts in your mind. Natalia, you. are there any specific um, adaptations that Duna frequently makes um, for yoga classes with survivors of um, sexual assault and intimate partner violence? I know um, from speaking with some of Duna's yoga teachers, there were at least a few things shared with me. I think one, in one case, um, it worked better for the women to do the yoga in a circle rather than in rows. Um, it, it felt safer that way to see the, the full group. Are, are there any things like that um, that might be useful for um, practitioners in the Canadian context to think about if wanting to implement yoga um, in a trauma-informed way? Yeah, um, thank you for that, Mamie. Um, <clears throat> the circle is one of the best um, practices that, that we've um, implemented for survivors of sexual violence. In general, um, not having someone um, behind you or looking at you from behind while um, doing postures and, and engaging in different exercises um, might be much more comfortable for survivors. So um, a, a circle layout instead of a, a regular yoga class layout um, definitely helps. Um, the trauma <clears throat> informed type of yoga where you invite um, participants to, to, to go as far as their body um, feels comfortable um, and to invite to close their eyes if they feel comfortable, you know, not, not forcing anything because um, I, I guess Western yoga with all the adjustments and, and you know, wanting a perfect posture and, and um, push a little bit harder, just a little bit harder. Um, that's, that's just um, a language that, that, is, that we found is just not helpful. Um, for survivors who are trying to regain a sense of control over their bodies. So um, another adaptation that, that we use is always try, um, I don't know if there's a proper English word, but invitatory language, you know, where you always invite um, and, and you always um, try to make people aware of what their body is telling them, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, 
closing your eyes for relaxation, that's fine. If you don't feel comfortable um, doing any posture, um, try an alternative or just stop wherever you feel comfortable and, and make them feel that whatever they do is adequate. You know, it's, it's very important that survivors feel adequate. Um, so, so when you use language like try a little harder or push a little farther um, in, in a specific posture that might create, again, that feeling of inadequacy that is very common in, in survivors of sexual violence. And Janet um, responds, yes, thank you. If uh, I've used these approaches, which I learned from my training, Dr. Vander Kolt's group a few years ago and have found that uh, choice is also VIP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important. How has the, the pandemic changed the operations, your operations um, in peace building and in, in, in communities? Well, we had a whole year where we just had one project. Um, 2020 was, was very difficult um, because we, we do rely on techniques that, that require a degree of in-person settings, you know. So um, during 2020, we tried some remote um, programs. They were very difficult because of the, you know, the connection difficulties that here in Colombia, most of the people who are vulnerable, who have been affected by violence, um, are also affected by a lack of in good internet connection um, and data in their mobile phones is very expensive. Um, <clears throat> so inviting them to, for example, a yoga class can can take up all of their data for a month. Um, so, so it, you know, moving to the virtual has been really, really um, difficult for us. So, what we've done is we've just um, implemented a, a lot of um, biosafety procedures. Um, we we bring um, all sorts of um, yeah biosafe practices in the communities and as soon as they reopened um, we we came back to the territories which we definitely believe is the best way um, for our work to unfold so since 2021 we are again in the territories um, implementing safe distancing um, alcohol having um, a break for cleaning our hands um, before um, taking any uh, refreshments. Sometimes we bring fruit if it's a very long session um, for the participants. So before they do that, they always wash their hands. And that's that's mostly what the, the way that we've been able to adapt because we did try the virtual, but um, in, in our context and, and our participants' context, it's just, um, it's too hard to ask them to, to find a proper internet connection. And it wouldn't necessarily be safe in some cases, right? Yeah, it's it's also, yeah, it's also very important in, in the context that we work with to have, you know, this safe space where you can actually contain participants um, when when the emotions are mm. overcoming them and and being physically there, it's also very important to be able to offer this containment. So, um, so some of the, of our um, of our strategies, like restorative practices, um, were just it completely. We we never tried <laughs> the the virtual part, and then well, our our yoga <clears throat> and our mind body practices are always very gentle. Um, they are. Um, anybody can do them, uh, even if, if there's a disability of, of any type, you know, we've had people in a wheelchair just imagining their, themselves um, doing the postures. And the postures are really very simple. We, we try to keep it simple um, so that every participant can continue to, to enjoy the benefits of the mind-body practice. So. So we don't do very difficult asana or, or you know, demanding um, breathing. We, we just um, try and focus on, on the very core aspects of, 
of yoga for stabilizing the um, autonomous nervous system. Mm -hmm. So, so those, you know, the, the postures in general are, are not risky um, from a virtual standpoint. It's more, it's more the, the psychological consequences of, you know, having your emotions poured out and not knowing, you know, they can't turn on their cameras mm -hmm. um, because of the, of the connection and, and not knowing, you know, what's going on and not, not seeing everybody else's faces reacting to your emotional um, storytelling is it's also just too hard. So, so that part, you know, and, and also the, yeah, the part, yeah, being able to contain and, and also being mindful of, of the limitations of our <laughs> internet connectivity especially mm -hmm. in rural areas, is, is the reason why we've chosen to go back to the territories and try to be as safe as possible while being there. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for either Mamie or uh, Natalia? I know that we're pretty much nearing the end. I had a few more questions. <laughs> I find it really interesting. Um, um, you know, all of the parallels, because we are, you know, you're talking about, about violence uh, more in a, um, you know, societal context. Um, you're also, you also talked about the individual part, but, you know, the, the parallels between the, the, the societal violence and the, the violence in, um, experienced by individuals and experienced physically and, and emotionally. Um, so I have to wonder, like, you know, I think about the, my own research that I've done with, with intimate partner violence and the difficulty we've had um, and that we have on a regular basis with um, engaging survivors of violence um, and how that can be really um, um, complex. Um, and I wanted to get a, a better sense of how, like what the engagement looks like for, for, for you. And I think, Maybe it'd be more question for Natalia to start with, but I think maybe you as well in terms of like your research, like wh what kind of approaches did you take with engagement? Yeah. So, so I, you're right. Oh, go, go ahead, Mamie, please. No, I was just going to say, Natalia, it, I think it would be interesting too if you told everyone sort of the scope of the project. Um, there are, you know, thousands of people involved and I think hundreds maybe of trained yoga teachers sort of within this framework um, across Columbia. So their network and, and reach is really, really big um, in how it's developed over the past 10 years. Thank you very much, Mamie. Um, I think we, we work very hard in articulating with um, other institutions. Um, Dani, I think you mentioned at the beginning or, or maybe it was Norma. Um, who talked about, you know, interdependence and, and how we rely um, on other institutions to provide, you know, our services. So um, for, for every program that we do, we're always partnering with um, the government, you know, um, the authorities of the community, the um, elders that we're, we're working with indigenous communities. Um, the, the pastors sometimes, because we sometimes have to um, speak to, to the religious leaders um, so that participants can have um, a peace of mind that they're not doing something against their, their spiritual um, chosen path. <laughs> so um, I think before starting any program, um, we come to the community and, and we spend a lot of time articulating our efforts with um, any other institution in the community and the government as well. Um, so, so what we do is we 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 call it socializing the initiatives, <laughs> um, and and we get help from leaders, government, and partner organizations to call people to these um, socialization meetings. Um, then when we have them there, we tell them more about the programs, about the benefits of the programs, show them pictures of other people who look like them, who've been through the same program and who sometimes have testimonials or if, if there's 
the possibility of showing a video. Um, we show them a video of, of people saying how they felt after going through this. Um, but, but obviously there's some uh, people who are harder to engage. For example, ex-combatants from the guerrillas, um, whom we also work with. Um, they, they actually, what we do is we partner with the government organization in charge of their reintegration into society. And um, their attendance to our workshops is counted as progress in their reintegration route. So they get a, a, a monetary stipend from the government if, if they comply with the reintegration activities. If they don't come to, to the workshops, then um, they, they, they are noted as missing one of the requirements to get their stipend. <laughs> so, so I guess it all, it all depends on who can you partner with, you know, cooperation and collaboration efforts in, in this area, like in any other area are really very important. So um, if, if people are very hard to engage, then find what is it that motivates them. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the case of our ex-combatants, it's the monthly stipend. So how do we get locked into <laughs> the activities that, that give them a right to, to claim that stipend? Right. Um, so, so that's that's what we mostly do. But it's um it's a, a different process with each community, and I guess we we just need to come to the territories first and find out more about what's troubling them and and showing them how what we're offering them can can help them, you know, in dealing with those difficulties that they themselves identify. Hmm. Thank you. No, oh, I muted myself. So uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, so what we'll do before the end of the, uh, I forgot about sending the um, uh, the survey at the end. So I'm going to send you the survey now in the chat so that you can either uh, fill it out then or you'll also receive an email um, with uh, the valuation link uh, probably tomorrow morning. So I'll send it in the chat right now. Um, I have so many screens going here. I have to find my screen. <laughs> there you go. Um, so thank you very much to both of you. Um, um, this was a really great uh, conversation. We went a little over time. I'm glad to see that we still have some people that stuck, stuck with us. Um, so, um, Thank you for your, uh, I, I'd like to thank uh, Mamie and uh, Natalia. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll be uh, sending a uh, link for the evaluation. Um, if you'd like to contribute to the Mural McQueen Ferguson Center's ongoing efforts to provide knowledge transfer um, and education events, uh, you can support us through a donation to the Ferguson Foundation. Um, you can visit their donation page on canadahelps.org uh, to direct your donation to the Miriam McQueen Ferguson Center's fund. Thank you very much.